everyone um, and welcome to the Center for Public Justice workshop Loving Your Neighbor Through Advocacy. Why should I as a Christian care about public policies that don't impact me? My name is Maddie Allen and I'll be moderating our conversation today. I serve as the Advocacy Manager at the Center for Public Justice. Um, for those of you who don't know us, the Center for Public Justice is a Christian. She takes great joy in using good words and better listening skills to illuminate the perspective of others. She is a proud New Orleans. Khadija, her husband, and children, and their very affectionate Rottweiler, now live on an unexpectedly bucolic track of land in Columbus, Ohio. Um, to our other on our, I'm still on my left, everyone's to my left, <laughs> Dr. Vincent Baco. Uh, Dr. Baco is a professor of theology and director of the Center for Applied Christian Ethics at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Uh, his publications include books such as Reckoning with Race and Performing the Good News in Search of a Better, of an Evangelical Theology and The Political Disciple, A Theology of Public Life. He is a fellow for the Center of Public Justice, a Trinity Forum Senior Fellow, and has been Assistant Theology Editor for Christianity Today, and has also been a columnist for Comet, and has also had articles appear in magazines such as The Banner, Books and Culture, Christianity Today, Think Christian, and many, many more. <laughs> he is an avid tennis player, occasional bass guitarist, and an incessantly curious person. He lives in the Chicago area with his family. Lastly, we have Stephanie Summers, who is the CEO for the Center of Public Justice. She is a co-author with Michael J. Gershon and Katie Thompson of Unleashing Opportunity, Why Escaping Poverty Requires a Shared Vision of Justice. She's a frequent speaker and moderator. She's also contributed a chapter to the edited volume of the church's social responsibility and has written for publications including Comment and Q Ideas. <laughs> she has a master's degree in nonprofit management from Eastern Uni University, where she also chairs the board of fellows for the PhD in organizational leadership. She, prior to her appointment at the Center for Public Justice, she spent 12 years with the CCO and where her roles included Vice President for the Eastern Region and Vice President for Organizational Development. She's a native of Pittsburgh, <laughs> where Stephanie began her career in nonprofit administration as Executive Director of the Open Door of Church Faith Youth Center in Pittsburgh, PA. So to start it, we will go ahead and get into our panel, but there will be time at the end for questions from the audience, so please take note of any questions you may have um, so that we can discuss them. So first I have a question that all the panelists will answer. So could you tell us how your faith has informed both the type of public policy that you support and how you advocate for those policy? Um, and we can actually just go in order. So Khadija, if you would like to go first. Good morning. I realize depending on what kind of university you attended is either very early or very late for you right now. Um, I think in that way, truth be told, my faith and my life have converged um, to determine what kind of public policies have really risen to the top. Um, it is also um, kind of the, the folks that my faith journey has put me in front of through my life. Um, so I can literally think back to the time when I lived in Pittsburgh. I had college students who were um, refugees from what we now know as South Sudan. Um, at that time, I'm not sure about today, but at that time there were a significant number of refugees from that part of the world living here in Pittsburgh, um, and I had several who were students of mine. That was a conflict that wasn't particularly well known at the time, um, so literally life on life with my students helped to give me kind of a better sense of what was happening there um, and what it looked like for me to be advocating for this particular population of people. Um, I think there are times that we see things on the news that really, that strike us and really prick at the place where like our heart meets God's heart. Um, and then there are times that it is literally the stuff that is, in, that is happening in our own lives that does that. Um, as a young person living in Pittsburgh, 
at some point I started volunteering for a local HIV AIDS advocacy organization. Um, I wasn't writing policy for them. I was literally showing up at a dinner they had once a month for folks who were infected or affected by HIV. At the time, my only connections to the illness were my mom had had a cousin who passed away in the kind of first wave in the late 80s. Um, and my mother was working for an agency that cared for folks who were infected. Um, those might not seem like good enough connections. And truth be told, like they weren't near enough motivation for most people. What I found was like when I thought of folks who were on that journey, um, there is a scripture that uses um, this. It talks about being moved, but it literally means like moved in your gut. Um, and I found myself moved <coughs> in my gut um, to do something. And it took me a while to be a welcomed presence there because as someone who was working for Jesus for a living, um, there was an understandable skepticism about what my motivation to be in the room was. Um, and my motivation was just love, and that love really came back to me in that space. So. I think for me, uh, the way it's kind of developed is as a subset of or part of me thinking about why Christians should care about public policy in the first place. Um, because of, I think, being aware of the fact that a lot of Christians might care about particular issues, but it wasn't always clear why they should care about them uh, or even why they should care about being involved in politics in the first place. So for me, it emerges out of that kind of um, uh, concern. And so for me, I think the, the thing is that a lot of my work is, at one level, just trying to help people to think about why Christians out of their faith should care about politics in the first place. That, that's been, you know, they're, they're sort of what, you know, what's Vince Bacon's thing. It's like telling people that you really should be involved in this and really, and, and if you're in a place like the United States, you have a unique opportunity to be involved in that because you have greater agency than people have had in most of world history. And so for me, the way my faith leads me there is the why of being involved in the first place. So which then, what is it that we believe as Christians that orients us there? So some of that is the cultural mandate type of language. That's always been our responsibility to, to do that and that God has never negated that. And that then as part of that, advocacy for issues in general is part of that participation uh, in the world in terms of seeking to, to bring flourishing to the world. And I think more specifically in terms of thinking about what's going to be orienting someone to public policies, the, the, the larger frame for me is thinking about how it, is this a practice of neighbor love. So if the two greatest commandments are about loving God more than anything, which on the one hand means don't worship anything other than God, right? It's a positive way of saying have no other gods before me, but also only worship God. And then the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And you know, neighbor is never told to us as only the people that we think are neighbors. It's, and, and the parable of the Good Samaritan makes it pretty clear that really your neighbor is any other human being, any image bearer. And so that command then to love your neighbors is really seeking the good, seeking the flourishing of people, which means on the one hand, how am I thinking about ways that people can be encouraged to seek the good of others, but also, at, at how am I aware of the ways that people are being antagonized as neighbors? In other words, what are the ways that things are happening that are antagonizing their possibilities for flourishing? And so, so then, if we're thinking about public policies, what are the things that are happening locally or internationally, from the local to the international, if you will, that are examples of how you're looking to facilitate flourishing or to, um, or to work against the many ways that people are being antagonized. In other words, the neighbors are being, the flourishing is being antagonized or, or thwarted. And of course, part of the problem that arises with that, if you talk about the whole big world, is that which things are there? And, and so I, the, the way I like to try to sort of get off the ledge about that, because you can wind up either being paralyzed or just looking left, looking right, how can I care about everything, is to say, you know, have an awareness of the fact that 
there are lots of issues, but then you have to make choices, right? Because you can't attend to every issue on the globe, right? So, no, I mean, most of us in here are probably not trying to resolve whatever's happening in Myanmar with the Rohingya, for example, right? But that's, but that's a, a, a major issue. Um, so, so how am I thinking about what are particular areas of uh, either open vistas are flourishing or way flourishing is being antagonized and then trying to see wh which ones are important. But I think that this other part goes with it, which is being aware of the fact that sometimes um, there are issues that matter to us and don't matter to other people and we think it should matter to them, but it's not on their horizon, right? So I think there also needs to be the ongoing work of helping other people to understand that just because they don't see an issue as important, that doesn't mean it's not important, or that a pursuit of a public policy is not important. So like what Khadija's doing with all the things related to, to black women and, and pregnancy, I learned a lot of things yesterday. You know, even, even though you know, I've got two kids, my wife breastfed, et cetera, there, there, there are a lot of things that, that I learned or things related to uh, you know, women in the workplace and, and their pregnancies. Uh, and then after, right? And then once they've had had the child, so th so I didn't know about that. But but now that it's on my horizon. Like, oh, this is something you need to care about. It doesn't mean I'm going to specifically advocate for that. But I know that it's something I need to pay attention to. And now I have an awareness of that. So I may pick certain things, but I also need to be aware of that. There are a lot of other important things as well. And and you at least want to support or encourage people to put effort toward that as well, even if it's not my particular thing. So, so that's generally the way that I've tried to go about this. So the best part of being the last person on the panel is you get to hear everyone's really good answers and then decide what you're going to jump on. Um, so I um, grew up in Pittsburgh in the North Hills, uh, and I did not grow up in a Christian home, and I wasn't a person of faith. Um, and I became a Christian right before I went to college. But I was politically active before I was a Christian. Um, and I would characterize that time as, uh, you know, sort of self-interested, you know, like, oh, people will do stuff that I get them to do uh, as we advocate together on particular issues. Um, so I was like the student in your high school that was organizing like letter writing campaigns or, you know, protests or things like that. Um, and uh, I would characterize it by saying, you know, so I got that whole self-interested thing and then also um, it was really a lot of what I was against not what I was for. So if I could talk about it as lots of things that were sort of de um, destructive as opposed to constructive, uh, how, how do things need to line up with justice? Those were not exactly my motivations. Um, I became a Christian right before I went to college and um, as I spent more time in scripture, uh, and thanks be to the CCO for you know taking a student like me who had a lot of passion and not a lot of knowledge and being like, hey, let's like actually study scripture together. Um, I saw this beautiful theme through scripture, you know, kind of the biblical theme of justice from the beginning to the end. And, um, and you know, scripture is filled with all of these, you know, uh, very clear commands to care for the most vulnerable. Um, and I'll just say, I was, I was sort of cut by that as a person because I definitely was not vulnerable. You know, I went to the best school district in the state. Um, you know, uh, definitely, you know, like my dad had a C-level title. Um, so I was a person who, when I got into trouble as a high school student, I had what sociologists refer to as like airbags. Like everything came around me to make sure that my life didn't crash and burn. Um, and as I spent more time in scripture, understanding the command to care about people who weren't like me, and I spent more time in the context of Christian community, being invited to serve people who were not like me, and then realizing in the context of the service that there was no difference between me and those other folks, right, ontologically. Um, you know, we were all image bearers. Uh, none of us were the worst things we had ever done. Um, those realities kind of were all soaking, you know, in, but I didn't know how to put it together with like, okay, what's this? I didn't actually didn't even think about the politics stuff. It was kind of like, for me, it was sort of before Christ, I did this advocacy stuff, and now I'm, you know, not going to do that stuff anymore because um, my motives were bad. I came to the Jubilee Conference <laughs> my sophomore year and uh, met 
Jim Skilland, who was the president of the organization that I believe now. So I was 19, and um, he gave a talk on the biblical theme of justice, and it kind of put this piece in front of me where it was like, hey, you know what? Like, the problems you're encountering when you're like serving, you know, soup kitchen, mission trips, tutoring, like, there, there are structural problems in society that only government can address, and we can't tutor or soup kitchen our way out of those things. There's another dimension here, and Christians' tendency is to step out of that space because it looks like crud. And for me, it was like, oh wait, and all these pieces came together because it was like, well, what part of the world doesn't look like crud when we talk about the totalizing effects of fall in the world. And at the same time, God's story tells us we're going to get to something glorious. And the task for us as Christians is to be people who invest every part of who we are, including ourselves as political beings in a society we share with the members. That cut me. And, in a really good way, helped introduce me to a whole framework uh, for how I could put these pieces together. Um, and it became a way that I could deal with all the problems that were my problems with motives, became a way that I realized none of this stuff relied on me as a solo person, uh, became a way to have wisdom about what I was doing and start to understand, like, yeah, what's the difference between government's responsibility and the responsibility for you know someone to do something for themselves. Those kinds of questions were all questions that I started to be able to have answers to in the context of Christian thinkers who were really doing some of this work. So good. Uh, um, so our first question is for Dr. Bayko. Um, there can be a temptation to use public policy as a tool to try to legislate God's commandments. How can Christians engage with public policy in a way that both honors God and the commandments he gave in scripture, but also acknowledges the profound differences and opinion on critical issues and public policy today? Thanks. Um, I think the first thing I would say is, I think it's important when we think about that temptation and the way that people will sometimes talk about it. Talk about it, that's better, I guess. Um, uh, so sometimes people will say you can't legislate morality. This is, of course, hilarious. <laughs> because there are no policies that don't have some kind of morality behind it. There's some reason why you think something is a good thing for society. They have some conception of what good is. That's some kind of morality, right? So it sounds great in a vacuum to say you can't legislate morality. What they really mean is I, I want to only legislate certain forms of morality. So, so once we note that, then we do have to think about the, the way that for some Christians, and maybe particularly the way that some people are talking about certain forms of Christian nationalism right now, uh, there can be the appearance, at least, of wanting to have forms of legislation that are putting into place, say, some version of the Ten Commandments. Um, and so the, the first thing I would say is, is that um, you should engage in public policy as a Christian in a way where you're thinking about how to bring good to the world because as a Christian you want to think about how to love your neighbors well. So how is our public policy ways of, of putting in some kind of at least dimension of neighbor love thing, where you are seeking the good for people. Because it is the public, however, and because you recognize that we are not in the realized kingdom of God, okay, we're, we're not on the other side. Uh, and also because you recognize, and I'll bring the doctrine of sin in at this point, you recognize that even though you may be a person who is saved, um, you know, Paul said in Romans 13, you know, we all see through a glass darkly, which, you know, which means we don't see everything with crystal clarity. Now, what does this mean? Well, this means that even if you're thinking about having perhaps the most biblical, orthodox, theologically based public policy, you're really seeing it through uh, a very opaque frame, right? You, you, know, you know, opaque is not completely clear. Which means you can't be all that certain that whatever you're going to do is going to be the thing that puts the kingdom of God into practice. And of course, 
then we also have to bring in historical memory in here, which is that sometimes Christians have done great things in terms of bringing things about politically. And other times, there have been um, political ambitions that have not worked out so well, right? They've, they've been misguided. So, so we have to be aware of that complexity just within the Christian frame itself. And if you're thinking about just that reality, whatever you are thinking about in terms of advocating for policies, you have to know that you have a, a limited frame of reference. And that even with a bunch of the smartest, perhaps most sanctified people that you know who are interested in public policy, you're all still kind of dim <laughs> in terms of just how <laughs> just clearly so good, that's okay. you can see. True. The point doesn't mean then don't do anything. It means be humble about it. And recognize that what are you doing then? You are doing something that is going to have a sign on it, one of those blinking signs that says, subject to refinement and revision. Because no matter how good it is, it's not going to be the best possible thing that there could be in the eyes of God. And so just that alone means that you're going, whatever you're doing is only going to be okay, maybe. Right, so there's that part of it. Then there's the fact that Christians aren't the only people in the world. And that to love your neighbor as yourself doesn't mean that there's the asterisk beside the neighbor. I already said there wasn't, but let's just point this out. That doesn't mean, so then when I do public policy, I don't think only for Christians. Because it's my goal of the public policy only to make the world good for people that are like me, in terms of what I believe. Or am I trying to think about what brings the greatest public good? And how do I discern what that might be? And so how, how am I thinking to do this in a way that's seeking good for all people and not just for things that are going to make it e easier for me? So I think that you, you have to be willing to be asking that kind of question if you're really thinking about loving your neighbor and not trying to think about a narrow range of interests. And then I think uh, that there is the fact, and I think this is one of the things that you know, I think the Kyperian tradition does help us with. It points out to us, look, there's a world of people that include you, but those other people are in that world too. And that when you're participating in the public, really the goal is not, how do I get into the public and dominate it? But really, a lot of times it's, how am I getting in the public and actually making a case for being a participant who's taken seriously? I mean, I think that, that's really the, the way to, to, I think we have to think about this. And if I'm being taken seriously, I want people to know that being taken seriously, I don't care just about myself, but I do also have an opinion at this table that we should all be considering together and let's try to work together to think about what are some things we can all agree upon that, that will help us to think about making things a little bit better in terms of a public policy. Because, and I guess here's another fact that I just also need to acknowledge, which is that um, I think sometimes the idea about Christians wanting to use policies and sort of legislate God's commandments, it assumes that all Christians see those things the same way, much less non-Christians. So um, the fact of the matter is, again, when people see through a glass, you know, not so clearly, that should not surprise us, right? Now, please understand, because I'm saying people are dim, that doesn't mean stupid or anything, it's just acknowledging the fact that we just don't see that clearly and Christians don't see that clearly. Therefore, what do we have to be doing? We've got to be sort of like at the table together thinking about what are the things we can prioritize? What, what, what are the things that we see that are most important? Perhaps what are the things that are the most urgent? And again, not just because Christians care about them, but because we're thinking about all human beings. And I think if there's that kind of disposition, and if people see that kind of commitment, then they see that Christians are really seeking, when they think thinking about public policy, they're not just thinking about themselves. But you do also have to recognize that for some people, no matter what you say, as a Christian, they think, well, you know, uh, I was around some Christians who, they said, you know, they love the Lord's Prayer, and they love the part that says, you, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And for them, that's really what they want to instantiate with public policy. To which I want to say, yeah, you, yes, there are some Christians who are like that, but that's not going to be most of your Christians. 
and most of your Christians that are involved in, in, in thinking about public policy. So you just acknowledge that those people are there, but most of the people, especially if they're involved in the political process, what are they going to understand? That if you're working with people, and it's a, a, a people with all kinds of interests, you're trying to get at least a little something moving forward. Because you're not going to get some kind of pristine, at least imaginatively perfect kingdom vision policy through, even if you wanted to. Because in our republic, that's just not how, how the process works. So if you're acknowledging the process, you have to contend with the fact that you're working with the plurality of people, plurality of ideas, plurality of interests, and how are you in the midst of that trying to say, amid that, how am I trying to get some dimension of neighbor love put into practice through public policy? Thank you so much. Um, so Khadija, you're a passionate advocate for family supportive policies like Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, expanded Medicaid, paid family leave. Why do you think that it's important for college students and young people to also care about family policies that seemingly do not even impact them yet? So we have a tendency to think of public policy and money, especially, in terms of winners and losers. And we want to win. Um, and sometimes that desire to win makes us think we must advocate for the things that benefit us even at the expense of the losers. Um, and that's, that's not like Jesus. Like, we cannot say that we are aiming to live a life that is modeling the life of Jesus and not be compassionately concerned with things that aren't a part of our life and our story. Like, nothing about the woman with the issue of blood's life would seem to be something that Jesus personally was impacted by or personally cared about. Nothing about the woman at the well's roller coaster of a life would seem to be something that directly impacted or should have necessarily pricked the heart of Jesus, the person. Um, but we see him care deeply, go out of his way, be inconvenienced, and die for some stuff that on its surface wasn't going to get Jesus, the person, Mary's kid, Joseph's stepkid, anything. Um, and if we're saying we are trying to be like that person, we can't, we can't be walking around only thinking about what benefits us, one. Two, these things do impact you. Um, and whether it's that they impact you as a kid because you have a parent who now or someday will find themselves in a medical situation that requires someone to help them. And you are the logical someone. But you work the kind of job that means you are going to need to quit to do that. That's, that comes. Um, for some of us, it comes really young. For some of us, it'll be a while. But it's wise for you to think long term in your life. Um, whether it means that in four years you will find yourself pregnant and have the kind of morning sickness that means, yes, maybe not you. I can't, I can't see your parts, so I don't know whether or not that is possible or true. Um, but you will find yourself with a kind of morning sickness that means that you cannot function in your life. Um, and you will need someone to give you permission to take a break so that you and this kid can make it to the other side of this okay. Or you will find yourself married to somebody who that's true of, someone who needs you to literally help them to eat while they get through that season of life. Or you will find yourself in a small group with a person who gets in a car accident and doesn't have any family that lives anywhere nearby or has any sense of obligation to help them. And you will think of yourself as the perfect person to help them 
and you will feel great joy at the thought of helping them. And you will struggle to tell your supervisor why it is you need six weeks off from work to help this lady in your small group get out of the bed every day because you're not related to that lady or your aunt who helped to raise you. So you're not going to get any time off work or your spouse will die and you will discover that your job has a leave policy that gives you three days off from work and expects you to show up three days after your spouse's funeral and operate like nothing happened. These are things that happen to real people. I didn't pull any of those things out of the sky and I just wanna acknowledge that for some of you, I've brought up something that's been a part of your real life. Um, so if you, if you need to take a breath, like literally like breathe in and grieve that reality of your life, you have permission to do that now. But we operate in our lives every day, whether it's that you're currently working at Subway um, or you work in the bookstore on your campus with people who are experiencing those things. Uh, and God's heart is broken by those things. And if you are telling us that you are aiming to live a life that emulates God's heart, your heart must be broken as well. And your everyday ordinary life is impacted by what happens to people who are in those situations right now. Whether that's on your job, in our session yesterday, I use an example of like, I, I see this poster at my job all the time that says like domestic violence affects all of us because domestic violence doesn't just stay at home. Like people who are in those experiences bring those experiences to work. Um, and it strikes me because that's true not just of domestic violence and not just of some jobs. When the person making your hamburger is exhausted because they were up all night with a sick kid but they don't have the leave time to not show up at work that day, you might end up with mayonnaise on your sandwich when you specifically ask to not have mayonnaise on your sandwich, which is inconvenient. When the person who is a construction worker shows up to the job exhausted because his kid was up all night and he puts the beam in incorrectly, today, tomorrow, next week, that could have a different kind of impact on your life. When the person who builds the levee that's next to your house has some long-term disaster happening in their life, but they have no opportunity for leave time, so they are tired and upset and distracted every day for six weeks, they might dig three inches short every day for six weeks, not because they're terrible, but because they're having a hard time. When the flood comes, you will be impacted by the fact that that person was not able to do what they needed to do to be well. Wow. Uh, whenever Khadija talks about family policies, it just, it gets me. Um, so, um, thank you so much. Uh, Stephanie, you kind of touched upon this a little bit when you first started, but it's often easy to advocate for our own interests um, or the things we're passionate about, but how can students take that next step to advocate outside of themselves? So I, I love this question in part because every person who's part of my staff team is gonna hear me say a sentence I say at work a lot, which is not knowing how to do something is a fixable problem. Okay, all my staff just nodded. Um, <laughs> um, so here's, that's really good news, right? We don't know how to do the thing right now, maybe, and that's fixable. Um, so a couple thoughts here. You know, I, I talked about this in my first answer a little bit about, and, and Vince talked about that kind of proximity. Um, you know, think about your real life and what's near you, where God's given you passion or relationships, you know, um, the academic program of study, what your major is. Right, who are the people um, and what are their lives like? 
and this may require you to do a little bit of like you know reflection, which is completely fine. Um, to try to get a sense of like, okay, for some reason God has given me a particular set of details uh, that I could pay attention to, and what what's going on there that there's potentially a place um, where there's a need uh, that needs to be addressed in some systemic way. So my earlier example of like we can't soup kitchen or backpack buddies out of some of the structural problems that we have. The, the second is this idea, I would say, of releasing pressure on oneself. Uh, you know, anything that we do, to Vince's point, is really proximity in terms of proximate to justice, right? Like we're not, we're not bringing in the kingdom through, you know, kind of this work. Um, and so releasing yourself from a false sense of, I'm, I've got to do it perfectly in order to do anything. Like just instead say, I think something ought to be done. Let's figure out what that something is. Rather than just, Vince uses the language a lot of like sitting on the bench, if you're a sports person, you know, so like don't just sit on the bench, don't be a bench sitter. Um, the, the, the third thing is really this idea of joining with others. Um, so it becomes really overwhelming really quick if you start to think, I have to X, Y, Z. And so, you know, that's why in the sort of starting for advocating for others, I'm encouraging you to think about like real humans who you know, or real situations that are around you. Not that that means you won't ever do something for the Rohingya, right? But like the reality is you have a unique set of insight into certain situations because of where you sit, what you do professionally, you know. So just to give you an example, right? Students who are in accounting programs, <laughs> like have a different lens on the world than students who are in social work programs, right? If you're an accounting student, like tax policies that exempt landowners over the age of 65 from paying property taxes, yet tax the heck out of the poor, are not great policies and it makes stuff happen in certain communities that means that the poor are always victimized by the tax policy and the people who are most able to pay, potentially, always, um, are scot-free from paying taxes. There's questions that an accounting student could actually do some work on in a way that like your social work student is like not thinking about tax policy and not able to think about tax policy necessarily. So, um, The other is, you know, thinking a little bit about um, you know, where the role of different institutions comes in. Um, so we lead at the Center for Public Justice several um, public policy and political coalitions on particular issues. So one that we lead is um, called Faith for Just Lending. Uh, and you know, when Maddie works with the folks from Faith for Just Lending, the goal really is to look at um, payday loans and predatory lending practices that basically make all their profit by victimizing the poor who are in a jam. You don't have enough money to pay for an emergency and you get sucked into a loan whose model of the loan is to just keep revolving the loan, making you pay more fees to have more loans. And you're kind of like trapped. You, I mean, they literally call them debt traps. Um, there are certain things that aren't the government's job to fix about those, right? Like, you know, so if you think about it at the level of, like churches need to disciple their members to understand that we need to function more like the church of Acts, where people actually help each other when they're in a jam, not be discipled by, you know, kind of a cultural vision that says, I've got to take care of my own business. So rather than me coming to my church and saying, I'm in a jam and I need help, going to a payday lender and then feeling responsible, like I took care of myself and I didn't burden those people with my problem. Right? That's, that's way far away from the church to acts, right? The government doesn't have anything to do with that, right? Um, but the church does. And so, like the church being the church, um, you know, is, is part of the issue there. Families need to be responsible, right, in terms of how they steward the resources that have been given them, right? And so for some folks, like, the choices that people are making 
are part of the challenge for why they don't have the resources for being in a crisis. And so there's a piece about like stewardship of resources. Again, government doesn't have anything to do with that. But in terms of, here's a thing that government does have a responsibility for, or here's a responsibility of businesses, right? Payday lenders could make money without exploiting people as their business model. So you know, if you are thinking about what is the norm for business, it's the, the satisfaction of profit, not profit at exploit, like profit that is occurring at exploitive levels. Um, how, you know, can we just get the maximum profit out of something? And that's what payday loans are designed to do. So instead, it's like, hey, business leaders, you need to temper your appetite for profit so you're not building a thing that just exploits people. Again, businesses can choose to be businesses that run to satisfy profit and provide it something that people need without the government. But only the government can do something like set a rate cap on the level of the interest that someone can charge. That's only government that can do that. So when we think about how you approach a problem like that, when, when Faith for Just Lending goes and advocates to government officials, they say, hey, we know the church needs to do X, families need to do Y, businesses need to do Z, and we are encouraging them to do all that. But only you can say, hey, a 36% interest rate is enough for you to make money. And your state constitution, this is true story, which has 1,950% APR if you live in Missouri. The national average is between 300 and 500% APR. So think about what your student loan percentage is right now. These are the percentages we're talking about on these loans. You know, only government can put a cap on that and say that's exploiting people as opposed to offering them a service that they can use and need. Um, and so it's not, you know, it's discerning who's responsible for what, what institution in society is responsible for what. And I think that really helps us advocate for things where it's like, hey, you know what? Like, there's no way that people who are getting, say, exploited in the payday industry are going to be able to fix that rate cap problem for themselves. And the church can't fix it. Um, we're going to need government to do something here. Um, Similarly, I think the last question um, I often encourage people to ask is, what's upstream from the downstream problem that I've seen? So concrete example, right? Um, the uh, juvenile, so criminal justice, right? If you've been sentient in the last decade, you're aware of the deep racial disparities on incarceration, right? All kinds of challenges there, right? I was a teenager who did terrible, illegal things before I came to know Christ. I was white and wealthy and from the suburbs, and I get to be the CEO of a think tank, right? That's because the airbags deployed, right? And when I showed up in court, I had both my parents. I was wearing street clothes because I didn't get taken to jail. I got taken home to my parents. I had a lawyer. I got community service. I have no record, okay? I know that that's not the world that most of the people who are involved in the criminal justice system are. And I also know there's a lot of people who are like me that had the same airbags as I did and have a different path. But the criminal justice system, like that, that's like a downstream, right? What's upstream, right? So when I think about what's upstream and how we stop it, I start to think about things like, okay, school discipline policies, because the number one way that someone gets involved in the juvenile justice system is because there's a school resource officer, who's a police officer in their school, who rather than trying to figure out how to deal with the problems at the building level, not because they're jerks, but often because the discipline policy for the school district is set and they're just enacting the policy and they have to basically hand kids over to the police. And it is like a conveyor belt and there's all these off ramps, right? You can have diversion programming rather than, uh, you know, probation. All these opportunities for things to be different along the way as it's making its way downstream. I always try to think, how do we get upstream so we don't end up with just more folks on the conveyor belt? Um, and that doesn't mean we don't work on folks who are already in the system. But I'm trying to think a lot of the time as. Uh, as we start to do this, 
what could be things that would game change the whole thing. So we end up with less here and much more uh, different stories uh, for folks who are on the very beginning of that journey. Yeah, that was great. Um, I really want to save time to hear from any questions that you have, so I'm going to turn it to the crowd now. If you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll call on you. And if you could tell us your name and what college you're coming from, or if you're not in college, what area of the country you're in. Don't be shy. We yeah. have to answer really right hard there. questions. <laughs> All right, uh, my name is Ross Owens. I'm from Waynesburg University. And I was wondering, a lot of people are really, like they don't trust the systems mm -hmm. and they think that you can't really change them to not do something they were designed to do. And so if an institution was built on racism, yeah. you can't remove the racism from that. And so how would you guys respond to that? <laughs> I'll, I'll start. Um, it, it is a great question. So the first thing I would say is, are people sure that everything in the system is, is serving racism and keeping the things in place? The second thing I would say is, you're in the United States of America, which means you have, as I said earlier, more agencies than most people have had in world history in terms of doing anything politically. So, you know, like Stephanie was saying, are there things you can do upstream in this system? I mean, because, and particularly that Christians can do, because a lot of times, what are Christians doing? Watching other people do stuff. Or, 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 or basically saying, they're being told by their formation, well, those things aren't really important, those are things for other people to do, don't be so worldly, etc. And so then, other people are the ones who are doing those things, rather than Christians being the ones who are there. And so are, Christ, are, are Christians there who are being, of course, not just pious people, but people who are actually informed about what they should be doing, you know, so they're like Stephanie or Khadija in these situations. and. Uh, are, those, are those people there, again, not thinking, okay, how am I with one thing going to, going to reverse what's been happening for centuries? Okay, so that's not your goal, to create some revival by one legislation that changes everything. But, but what can you begin to change? And people have done those things. So, so I, I, I think... Sometimes when people are saying that, it's great to say that. It's a great talking point. It's true about how we got here. Um, it's not true about what's actually possible. The question is, what, what, what are you thinking is the thing you're trying to, to get accomplished in terms of the system, right? So is, is it you're trying to change the whole system like that? Or are you trying to attend to a small dimension of something? Which is a lot of times, that's what people are doing, right? And, and I guess the last thing I'll say is, that takes a lot of uh, willingness to be patient with very unsexy things. Those are not the things you can tweet about. Those aren't the things that, that are going to make you go viral. But they're the grinded out type of things that people are doing while everybody else is out having a good time, that people are doing that are working on those hard things. And so you have to be willing to do that and be doing that work uh, to begin to make those kinds of changes. But, you know, don't expect people to be patting you on the back about that, right? And I and, and, and I think and I think that's the kind of work that that you have to be doing. I'll 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 give a name to the elephant I think we're talking about, which is police violence. Um, theoretically, this is one of many elephants. Um, but specifically the idea of like, do we defund the system that we know in real life in our country was built um, and given its most thriving presence uh, to do some things that are pretty profoundly and in many places overtly racially broken. This is a thing, it's a thing. Um, and we don't do the institution any justice um, by pretending like that's not a thing or by pretending like there are not uh, people who benefit from certain aspects of brokenness. Um, and now I'm gonna, I'm gonna color this with some personal and societal experience. Uh, I'm originally from New Orleans. I'm a proud New Orleanian through and through. Um, and I am one of the people who believes truly that the South is better than the North. Uh, <laughs> I, I live in the North uh, by 
a hilarious set of circumstances. And I'm probably never gonna live in the South again, but I, I, I still like it better there. Um, the thing that New Orleans has in common with my current city, I live in Columbus, Ohio. Shout anybody in Ohio? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, is that just about every official governmental leader is black. The mayor, the chief of police, the head of the fire department, the head of the city council, head of the school board, most of the people on the school board. Um, but you will find that in both those cities, uh, the, the outcomes, the trajectory of people who look like me isn't necessarily any better. We can think of the particular tragedy that happened in Memphis within the last few weeks and say, how do we get to the point where like, it's people who look like you who are hurting you like that? Well, one, we do have to go upstream. Um, in, in one of my group chats, my group text messages, um, I am not Greek affiliated, uh, but lots of my friends are. There was kind of a sidebar about the fact that several of these officers were members of the same fraternity. Um, and that their fraternity in particular is known for a culture of violence in their um, intake process. Which you think like, well, sure, we can't blame it only on that, but like, it became a particular source of grieving in that circle that you, we knew upon seeing which fraternity it was that there was no way this was the first time that this particular set of young men had been celebrated for harming someone. Um, and like, how do we get there? Like, what do, we, what do we do about that? Like, that's a thing. We also have to talk about the fact that our goal is usually, even in policing, to handle what's in front of us, not what's upstream. And then ask ourselves in our holy imagination if that's the way it has to be. Like, yes, there are absolutely times when you need a person who has the authority to do something, to show up. If that's never been true in your life, keep living. There are also times that you need a person with authority to show up, but you don't actually need them to have like a gun. So we, there's the, my bio says like, we live on a particularly bucolic track of land. Bucolic means like, uh, green, like farm, beautiful looking. I live in the actual city of Columbus and the tract of land I live on really is an acre, uh, which is weird, but it's because I live in one of the oldest black neighborhoods in the city of Columbus. Um, and the neighborhood has turned over a couple times through the generations. Um, and in the season in which my husband's family came to live there, uh, the tracts of land were humongous because nobody else there. Um, there was a season in which it meant there was like an alcove next to my house. Um, and this alcove became a very popular spot for sex work. Um, I, the, I'm, I'm talking like a hundred feet away from my driveway. Um, and you can imagine the awkwardness of pulling into your driveway with your kids while um, a job is being performed hundred feet away from your driveway, especially if you live in a little quiet neighborhood. That's not a solution that really requires a, like, you don't need a gun to stop that from happening. But you do need a solution. In our case, the solution was like, there's actually supposed to be a street right there. But the construction company behind it has eaten that street and no one at the government level has decided to do anything about that. Because it doesn't bother them it doesn't inconvenience anyone except my children who I have to figure out how to shield from the job that's being performed right there. I gotta yell somewhere other than the police department about that. Like I can call the police to shine their lights to get people to move along, but like the real problem is somewhere else. When my house got broken into by a set of siblings who were uh, truant but being raised by their single father who had done everything he could to get his kids to stop being knuckleheads. 
uh, but his kids had been pursued by the neighborhood elderly villain who was like putting them up to stealing stuff from the working people's houses because he knew exactly when they were gone. Like, that was an incredible like feeling of violation for me. Did they take anything that was critical to my life and work? No, but they took some stuff that I really wanted and that I had worked really hard to have. And they made me feel really scared that had I actually been home when they were in my house, something terrible could have happened. Well, one, because we were friends with our neighbors, we knew we weren't the only people this happened to. And because one of our neighbors had an elderly mom who was at her house all the time, she became like the neighborhood nosy lady. Like she was literally looking out of her window at all times because she knew she lived on the route that these kids were gonna have to take to get to the like most prized houses in the neighborhood. So when she saw them heading for the second time in the direction that she knew was where our house was, because she knew they didn't get all the stuff they wanted the first time, she called the police. Well, there was nobody else for her to call except the police. Like they were the right people to call. And ultimately, the police did not actually hurt anybody. They, they chased those kids off our property, which, great, because I really wanted to keep my TV. <laughs> um, but what it, what it set into motion in our neighborhood was like a collective, what are we going to do about these kids? It activated their father's sense of urgency about like, you need a solution in a different way. They didn't end up in juvenile hall. Is that even what it's called anymore? It's not. I'm slightly old these days. Um, but their family did end up moving. Their family was renting in our neighborhood. Um, and I don't desire for them to not have been housed and safe. But we had come to a place where our neighborhood was no longer going to be a logical place. Their father needed to get them away from the grown up who had acquired negative influence that was overriding his in their lives. Um, they had come to the point where there was damage being done to the house that they, that they were living in because there were some neighbors who weren't okay with it just being a solution that we just call someone every once in a while. Like, no, we're gonna break the windows in that house. Well, that sucks. But there had to be a real solution. And it was not actually the most logical solution for these kids to be arrested and put somewhere. They needed some help and I needed them to not be stealing my TV. Until we come to a place where like our, we think of our futures as tied up with one another, even uh, when we're hurting each other, we, we don't get anywhere far. Um, I feel like it's King that has a, a saying that's like our destinies are tied up with one another. Um, and there's this misconception that like faith in politics has only ever gone in one direction. And like that is and has always been a lie. Uh, Vincent is chuckling and shaking his head because we know that some of this is profoundly racial. Uh, black Americans have always been involved in politics and most of the time they have been on a different side of the aisle. Um, the truth is like, in that way, our own oppression has allowed us to give us a gift to society. We know what life looks like when the entire purpose of instituting policy and government is to make sure that there are winners and the winners aren't us. And we thank God that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the best version of our entrance into public life has not been how do we become the winners instead of them? Um, it has not been a revenge motivated entrance into politics. We have been able to look at the text of scripture and say, there is a better way. It is possible for us to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God. But we have to do something different than what we're doing. Um, I think for me, when I think of what the police structure looks like, and the fact that in my, in my city, because of legislation at the state level, it is not legal for my police department to only be comprised of people who are from my community. Like literally, there's a law in the books 
that says my city government can't say you have to live in Columbus to police Columbus. There's a reason for that. It's because it's a good paying job. And if you tell the people 100 miles outside of the city they can't have this good paying job, that's money that doesn't go back to that city. And I get that. But if everybody who polices my neighborhood is from 100 miles away from me, and the only conversations they ever have with anybody who looks like me are conversations in which they are in charge and have a gun, there are obvious problems that you are logically going to get from that. There's a better way. Yeah. So thank you so much for those answers. We are running low on time, but our speakers will be staying after, so if you have more questions, please feel free to come up and talk to them. If you are also interested in hearing more about the work that the Center for Public Justice does, please visit our website. We have information about internships, how to get involved, keeping up to date with different public policies and think, uh, faith-based thinkers um, in the political realm on our website. So please come talk to us. Um, we'd love to get you involved with loving your neighbors well through advocacy. Thank you so much.